This is Voices in Validation, brought to you by IVT Network. IVT Network is your expert source for life science regulatory knowledge. Voices in Validation brings you the best in validation and compliance topics. We interview industry experts from pharma, biotech, med devices, and laboratories. Here is the host of Voices in Validation, Stacy. Patient safety is the primary concern in medical packaging. When we think about packaging, we may immediately be concerned with straightforward patient communication and transparency. However, patient safety and packaging start way before the words are ever printed on the package or label. Today, we're going to discuss the nuts and bolts around selecting medical device packaging materials and sterilization methods to achieve appropriate sterility assurance levels and sterile barrier integrity throughout the labeled shelf life. We have invited Roberta Good to help us understand the intricacies of this process. So welcome, Roberta. It's great to have you back. Thanks, Stacey. I always love when I get a chance to talk with you and your audience. For sure. We love it. Um, Roberta, I, I want to talk about effective, effective decontamination through sterilization techniques, which is a key step in preventing the introduction uh, or transmission of potentially dangerous organisms um, and or diseases to the medical device and in turn to the patient, of course, which is our primary concern. So let's start off uh, with talking about the most common sterilization methods being used in the industry in terms of packaging. Can you help us uh, understand what's what's kind of the, the norm there right now in the industry? Sure. Um, Stacy. you know, before we dive in on the details of the topic, do you think it would be all right to for the benefit of our listeners, kind of provide a brief overview as to why this topic is so important? I think that would be fantastic, yes, because uh, some people might not think packaging is, is that important when you look at the grand scheme of things in terms of devices and pharmaceuticals, but it's, it's highly important. And I would love to just give a little brief summary of that for our audience. Great idea. Well, thanks. You know, I, I agree with you completely. We always, you know, as a design engineer myself, I, I remember the first time I realized that design of medical devices includes a very conscious, intentional design of the packaging as well, right? And that's not typical. Like you said, it's not, I mean, it's typical, but it's not expected, especially when you're new to the industry. You think, well, the medical device or the pharmaceutical, that's what it's all about. But actually, um, the packaging must be designed as intentionally and carefully as the device. So just as a brief overview for your listeners, um, you know, it, really what it comes down to for sterile medical device packaging, and not all medical device packaging must be sterile, but I think we'll be talking about sterilization and packaging today, so we'll address both. You know, the the sterile medical device packaging must do four things for the product. Basically, it, first of all, it must protect the product um, so, so that if your product is fragile or perhaps it's a very small part or very heavy or bulky, um, it would be easy for it to be damaged in transportation in the, throughout the supply chain, right? So the packaging must protect the product so that the product still meets its product specification for its intended use uh, when it arrives at the point of care. Also, the packaging is solely responsible for maintaining that sterility until the product is actually used on a human patient. And right. if you think about that, right, that means not just during the distribution cycle, but throughout the entirety of the labeled shelf life. If it should sit, say there's a shelf life of five years, so we've got 60 months to sit on a shelf somewhere. Right. And it will still be sterile, and that's all packaging. Um, it, it also needs to allow for easy opening and dispensing in the procedure room, if that's an OR or a cath lab or whatever it may be, um, because of you know, human factors, it, it right. should facilitate that activity. And then finally, and really, really importantly, as you know, with UDI, the packaging is the conduit essentially for labeling. It, it, it needs to provide for product identification, you know, any cautions, um, there can be graphics uh, that are important. And then, of course, if we're talking about a CE marked product, you know, we have to consider 
multiple languages or symbols and so on. So all of this relies on our packaging. And so when you explain it that way, you know, we begin to understand why this is such a huge deal, right? It's not just uh, packaging in, in, in this industry. It's not just about marketing. It's not just about attracting someone's eye, you know, to, yes. to the package, but it serves so many other purposes. Um, and I think that that's uh, really helpful for us to keep in mind as we move through the rest of this discussion. Um, and so I'm going to bring it back then to my first question, <laughs> um, which makes a lot more sense now to listeners, I'm sure. Um, so we can dive in on the uh, types of packaging that we would expect to see in the medical device industry currently. And so um, mm -hmm. we are talking a lot about sterilized um, packaging, sterile, uh, uh, sterile packaging. Uh, but of course, as you mentioned, you know, not every device or every package needs to provide sterility. But that being said, what are the, the most common sterilization methods being used in the industry today in terms of packaging? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. So, you know, this is an evolving area as technology advances so rapidly, Stacy, as you know, but the yeah. most common methods for medical uh, sterilization methods for medical devices are uh, ethylene oxide gas, also known as ETO mm -hmm. or EO in some cases, um, gamma irradiation using a cobalt 60 source and electron beam or E-beam for short. Those are the most common. And I, I, I believe- Yeah, go ahead. Well, I believe you were asking me about some of the pros and cons of each. I was going to ask you. Yeah, I mean, like everything, right? I'm sure that it depends on the device. It depends on the shelf life. It probably has a lot of factors, but how do we know which one to choose? You know, which, which are, what are the pros and cons um, to each of these methods? Sure. Well, there are a lot of, there are a lot of materials uh, considerations um, and package design considerations and product design considerations. And I think we'll, we'll get into those details a little bit more when we talk about design verification and process validation. Sure. Um, but you definitely will. Right. But, but in, but in a nutshell, you know, in a nutshell, yeah. At a high level, you know, so, so some of the pros of, of each of those methods, we'll cover pros first, perhaps. So with gamma irradiation, with a cobalt 60 source, for example, some of the pros are, you know, it, it's, it's got a 60 year proven track record in the industry and something like, I think it's over 40% of all single use medical devices that are sterile are sterilized using the cobalt 60 source gamma irradiation. Um, so it's a super it's, trusted it's, method. People are familiar with it, right? Super so trusted. That's yeah. And you can process large volume, you know, uh, volumes of product and, and even high density products with this method. Um, when it comes to, I guess, in comparison to electron beam, E-beam, which is also an irradiative uh, methodology, um, you have less penetration with an E-beam method than you do with gamma. So we're talking about products that are have lower density overall, but mm -hmm. an E-beam uh, solution is ideal because it's got an on-off switch. When you turn the switch off, there is no more radiation. Whereas with the Cobalt 60, you know, <laughs> part of its reliability is the fact that it's going to continue to radioactively decay, um, but but with the but you know you can't just be around that you've got to have all kinds of protections, um, and then with the ethylene oxide, talk about the sixty year being proven. Ethylene oxide has been used for medical device sterilization for over ninety years. Wow, um, it, it's so compatible with many many materials. Uh, um, it, it's just uh, it's tremendous. But you know on the downside with ethylene oxide, you've got to degas or aerate any residues or residuals that are in the product as a result. It is uh, combustible. We, there are some, you know, there've been some accidents wherein, you know, the chambers have exploded. Um, ethylene oxide is a carcinogen, mutagen, in fact. Um, right. I, on, the, on the downside, gamma irradiation, again, you know, you've got environmental concerns, the uh, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has to be involved in, in that. Um, but I will say in closing at a high level, 
I'm most excited about electron beam for products where it's appropriate to use. So we're talking again, not very high density um, packaged products, but it is so efficient and effective. You can put it in line in your manufacturing process, essentially turn the switch on and have the packages boxed and everything go right past that focused beam of electrons and come out the other side sterile, like a just in time lean manufacturing process. And we're all about that these days in the industry. Of course, absolutely. And so I'm thinking about the evolution then because these uh, methods have been around for so long, yes. uh, 90 years, 60 years, is, is the E-beam solution sort of the evolution is like, that's what we've evolved to. Um, or, you know, talk about what, if you've seen changes in the industry, in the, um, in the use of these methodologies or, you know, practices, I guess, um, sure. in the time that you've been in it. And, and, and also if you see any emerging technologies or any, uh, expect any new sterilization, um, tools or methods to be coming down the pike in the near future. Oh, sure. Um, it's a really exciting time actually. And there is. Well, what I've seen, you know, I've been doing this for over 30 years. You're really letting me date myself here, Stacy. But I guess the advantage of that is, is the ability to look back in a broad, you know, with a broad swath and say, what's changed? And when I first started in the device industry, we used to have ethylene oxide chambers in our facilities, right in the United States, within the manufacturing plants. And we would literally, you know, build the product, package the product, and then take it over to the sterilizer and sterilize it right there. Um, that was pretty typical. Of course, over time, the evolution has been to outsource that to, mm. you know, contract manufacturers that specialize just in that function. Um, obviously, the investment in capital equipment is large. Um, the risks, as I described, with regard to, you know, potential, you know, explosive explosive issues and and also environmental concerns you know having uh, trying to control where the gas goes and then the aeration and the cycles the ethylene oxide cycles are very complex there are a lot of variables working at the same time so i think in a case like that you really it makes sense that our industry's evolved to a a deep knowledge of how to manage this process effectively at a few sites rather than everyone trying to do it for themselves. Yeah. Right. No, that makes sense. It's going to be a lot safer and a lot more efficient when you have someone who's an expert in that particular um, method. And you don't, because it, it, it does, it's not something that you're just setting up in your manufacturing room somewhere, you know, occasionally. Yes. You know what I mean? This is like, you got to be all in on that technology. <laughs> that is so true. You said it perfectly. And so, yes. Go ahead. Well, and, and I believe you asked me, you know, what's exciting that's coming? What are the Yeah, for sure. Threats? So I was just going to address that. Um, I guess one of the most exciting things that's happening is ethylene oxide, as complicated as it is to use, I said it was a very many, many variables and it's, 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 it's a complex process. It requires a lot of monitoring and then you've got to have biological indicators and and make sure that you wait for you know, any growth there before you release the product. So now we've actually come to the point where we can have parametric release, which means, well, let me explain. Parametric release of medical devices after ethylene oxide sterilization. That means that once you have a high confidence that the process has been validated correctly and, and it's very robust and it's under control, and you're monitoring those key parameters, mm -hmm. you can actually use those key parameters, the, the, the measurement of those key parameters within a validated range, confirm that, and then release the product without waiting for these additional sterility tests that can take up to an extra seven days. Um, this is called parametric release. And it, until recently, that wasn't really available with ethylene oxide. Um, I'll also add that in the past 15 years or so, we're also seeing some new low temperature sterilization systems like um, a couple of examples would be hydrogen peroxide, gas plasma, um, parasitic acid uh, immersion, even ozone. 
And these are being, have been developed and are being used to sterilize medical devices at low temperatures. Many of these other methods we've talked about actually generate some heat with yeah. the with the exception of e-beam, which is the least damaging in that sense, but also the least penetrable. So with these new systems, you can have the low temperatures, which is much more friendly to many, many materials. So it sounds, I mean, so that's exciting that, um, you know, some of our old methods are actually being updated to yeah. work more efficiently and, um, and, and safely. Uh, and, then, and then obviously we have um, some newer methods that we are uh, looking to as well. Yeah. And keeping all of those things in mind, you know, it, it, obviously we have to then consider the types of packaging that we might be choosing from, right? Because that's, you can't really choose your sterilization method unless you know what type of packaging you're using and, and what the requirements are of those materials. So what device characteristic characteristics influence, um, you know, package selection mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I, so let's start there. Let, w talk a little bit about then selecting the right package. And obviously you're considering the device and then you're also considering your um, sterilization methods and your shelf life and all of those items. So how do we go about choosing the right packaging? Absolutely. Great question, Stacey. Well, first of all, there are some general types of packages available. Just this, and, and as I, I just like to give you sort of the broad four categories, if yeah. I may. And then I think it'll become clear how the device design influences the package selection. So first of all, we've got these impermeable types of pouches packaging yeah. for medical devices made of usually a film or foil, again, impermeable. Now, right. if we not choose, to get in. <laughs> that's, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> that's, exa that's exactly right. So in a case, so if you know that you're going to use ethylene oxide gas, for example, this wouldn't be a consideration, but impermeable packages are fine for non-gaseous sterilization. Um, then of course, we've got porous packaging, the opposite in a scenario, right? Where you know that you can use gas to, to penetrate the package for if you wanted ethylene oxide sterilization. These use uh, medical grade papers or other types of papers or Tyvek, the paper fabric combination material. And so this allows for the gas, the gas to penetrate and sterilize the package inside and the product. Um, then we've got our rigid packages. These are perfect, great for holding and protecting either fragile, bulk, bulky or heavy medical devices. Um, I once worked on a uh, radioactive uh, stent, for example, to prevent uh, the endothelium from regrowing in a vascular stent, you know, where you're holding an artery open. Right. So it had to be shipped in a, as you might imagine, a lead plug that weighed a lot. Yeah, I mean, right. that's a perfect example where you would use a rigid package because the momentum of that lead plug you know, when it's, if it were dropped or uh, it could be, it could damage the, the sterile barrier. And then finally, the last type of packaging is this flexible, flexible packages, which are for soft, pliable or very small products. And so as you think about the device characteristics, I think it becomes more clear and the sterilization, preferred sterilization method that you're going to go with one of those four types of product, rigid, flexible, porous, or impermeable? Sure. So give us an example then of, you know, selecting a package. Well, you did give us one example of the radioactive um, stent, but uh, so if we are set, something simple, like if we are um, packaging, let's just say, um, let's do something that everybody knows, like a, um, a digital thermometer. Maybe. Okay, sure. But for hospital, for, for whatever, sterile use, right? You want it to be, I don't know. I, I'm making it up. I'm not in, the, I'm not in your field, <laughs> but, but I'm just thinking of something that everyone would be, it, it's, it's hard, but if you want it to be A, sterile, but B, it's digital. So it's somewhat fragile. You don't want to bump it around. Like, how would you go about choosing a package for that? Okay, well, all right. So one of, one of the first considerations will be the supply chain. 
where do I want to sell this product? That's the first question I would ask as an engineer. Is this product going to be fabricated, for example, in the United States and distributed, uh, you know, let's say to the Asia Pacific region? Sure. Uh, in that case, I really need to think about, am I going to use, uh, most likely I'm going to use a seatainer, some kind of over the water transport. So I'm going to be thinking about packaging that is going to be highly resistant to humidity, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm probably not going to fly it a long distance. So I don't need to worry about pressure buildup, pressure gradients, atmospheric pressure changes. So you see how that starts to influence my packaging choices already. Right. Um, but to your point about the digital property of the thermometer in our example, I'll want something probably rigid that would protect the digital portion or component um, from any kind of uh, you know, impact at least side to side. And um, let's say that if, if, if this needed to be, let's say it were a single use device that's gonna be sterilized and then thrown away, right? A, a disposable. Um, I'd say it's probably a very low density item. We're not talking about a cobalt chromium hip implant, right? right. So um, I would probably look for an E-beam solution. So I would use a, maybe I'd use a rigid polymer tray um, with a non-porous lid stock, right? Because I don't need gas to get in. And that also will provide some protection against the humidity on the ocean as it's shipping. So just common sense, isn't it? It really is. But I, I, I only asked you that follow-up question so that people can start to think about all of the thought and detail that has to go into this. It's not just something that, you know, hey, I have this container lying around or I have like an extra gross of these and well, let's use them up. I mean, I'm sure sometimes that's appropriate, but like you have to really think about it. And that really leads us into talking about the design and the engineering behind it. And and so I'm hoping that you can talk about design, the design verification process for material selection and sterilization, um, because there sure. are industry best practices out there and some guidances around this. And, and so uh, I, sure. I'm leading us right down that path. And yeah. I'm hoping that you can talk to the listeners a little bit more about that whole process. Oh, oh absolutely. And, you know, I recall as you and I were talking, um, before we had our, before we came together this morning, you shared with me that your listeners are particularly interested in hearing about how to increase efficiency, right? In their manufacturing and their validation practices and so on. And so this question, I love this question, Stacy, because it really lends itself to I can give I can sort of answer both at the mm -hmm. same time. So when we think about design verification then and process validation uh, with regard to packaging and sterilization, you know, where one, where does one end and the other begin and how can we increase efficiencies? Well, we can stack and combine a lot of these tasks. So for example, uh, process validation would encompass our sterilization process itself, whatever we choose. Let's say we choose, um, ethylene oxide sterilization. There is a, a standard in the industry, an ISO standard that we'll use to validate that process, that actual process validation for that cycle. Um, and that results in giving us the sterility assurance level that we need depending on our intended use. So for example, if the product is going to go into, let's say we'll have contact with the blood, we need a sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus six very high sterility. So we're going to have to be mindful of choosing a sterilization method and packaging type um, and a process that results in that high, high degree of right. sterility assurance. Um, we're also going to consider the process validation of the packaging methodology in the manufacturing line. So this is after design is done, right? We'll, we'll make sure that whatever method we use to seal, for example, the packages. So you have the package selected and the product is made, the product is then inserted into the packaging. Everything's non-sterile at this point. Then the package is sealed. 
still not sterile, but it's sealed. And then it will be subjected to the validated sterilization cycle. And if that seal maintains its integrity, and if the entire package also maintains its integrity in spite of all of the shipping and the shelf life and, you know, shake and bake, and drop and compress, then we should end up with a sterile product at the end of the day, right? So, so those are the process validation pieces, but the rest is design. Um, so design verification makes up the in, everything else besides those two functions. So the package is designed just like a device is designed. Design controls apply, product realization from your ISO 13485-2016, right? Right. So we'll perform design verification testing to make sure that the package actually protects that product, right? So we'll put it through a simulated distribution testing. Um, and, and you've got to make sure that at the end of, at the end of everything that can happen to that product, which includes sterilization, then shipping, then sitting on a shelf for up to as long as a labeled shelf life, that that product is still protected by its package, that the package has maintained that product sterility throughout the same challenges, and that the labeling, again, so important, the labeling remains legible, adhered to that packaging. Right. Um, and, and so these are multiple complex undertakings, each of these steps, but we can combine them into a much more streamlined, more efficient um, method. Should I, should I share how we would do that? I think so. I mean, I, I really, at the end of the day, we're all looking for efficiency um, and patient safety. So anytime you can um, achieve both of those items, uh, you know, I think that's then you've reached your goal uh, or part of your goals anyway. So I, I think that it would be great to talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So, so let's, let's start with the end in mind. Um, shelf life. Right. Uh, you know, shelf life is a function of the materials of construction of the device and its packaging. Right. And any interaction between the two, as well as, of course, any sterilization effects, which can accelerate the aging. Right. Um, and so really, you know, the materials, so a lot of times, you know, we don't think about this, but the materials of construction of the device can actually, as I said, they can actually interact chemically or even just mechanically with the materials of construction of the packaging. So that over time, you know, with shaking and distribution and heat and time, that that combination can really create a, a totally different scenario than if you were to just look at each one in a vacuum. So I, I like to combine the product, you know, the final product test in the package into a combined study rather than, you know, the alternative, and this is what is used to be done a lot, is it's less efficient is to put dummy units not real medical devices into packages and then you know validate and verify the packaging. But then you've got to do all of this work with the product all right. over again to show that the packaging protected the product. So I find that combining those two is, is much more efficient. And, and here's another thing that has been really helpful. You know, you can stack all those challenges up into one big study the challenge testing that I was mentioning. So here's an idea for your listeners. Let's say that you think ahead and you say, you know, we're using, um, I don't know, let's use a different example this time, not the gas, ethylene oxide gas. Let's say it's gamma irradiation, cobalt 60. We know that if we put the product through sterilization and let's say there's a problem with one batch, I don't know, the, the sterilizing, uh, company, the, the contractor had a, some kind of glitch with the power supply. You know, we can actually think about this ahead and say, well, if we were to do what's called max maximum dose testing, 
what if we were to hit the product with the most radiation that we think it could tolerate safely? This means that in the future, if there's ever a problem at the sterilizer, we could actually ask them to re-sterilize our product up to the cumulative amount of irradiation dose. So and it's kind that, of like getting your worst worst case scenario out of the way yes. up front so you can, yeah, so you better know what flexibility you have uh, in, in, in terms of sterilization. Absolutely, because if we don't do it now, we can't do it later without repeating all of this testing and, and you know, taking a risk for our patients uh, and or any kind of regulatory scrutiny we might experience. Um, if we haven't fully verified and validated, you know, that we could expose the product to an additional dose. I mean, let's say that we think we can write it up and justify it. Well, what happens over the life of the product? We know that irradiation's effects, for example, can affect the life of the product. So unless we've actually looked at it over the entire labeled shelf life, it's really not, it's really not gonna hold water. So if we stack, if we put that in up front, and then let's say after the max dose, we subject the pro packaged product to our distribution simulation. And there are standards for that, such as ISTA 2A and ASTM D4169 um, in the industry. We subject it to this challenging distribution simulation in a lab is preferred because it's controlled. Right. Um, you can do you know, a over the road real life cycle, but mm, there's so many variables you don't we prefer lab testing. And then let's say we put it into our accelerated aging and real-time aging simultaneously um, environments. At the end, and then in, in intervals, at the end of, of multiple intervals I recommend, let's say you're going for a three-year shelf life, then perhaps after six months simulated right. aging, and then after a year and maybe after two years, and then at three years, I would pull out an appropriate sample size of product, perform all the package integrity testing that we need to perform. And at that moment, you can also test the product to make sure it still meets its product spec. So in that way, we've combined product design and package design testing because it's, it's, it's a large scale test either way. Why not do it all at once? And the benefit, right? And the benefit of inter taking product out in intervals rather than waiting to the end is let's say, first of all, if you take it out after six months and it works well, everything you know is validated and verified, you could actually have a limited release at six months shelf life and then relabel, over label and extend that. On the other side, if you waited till the three years, and for some reason it didn't pass, it didn't meet the test requirements, Right. you would have no fallback position. Yeah. You don't know where it failed, at what time? Like, yeah, really where, so uh, yeah, it's, it sounds like it's definitely um, best to select your intervals and make sure that you are doing the testing consistently at certain time timeframes. So you can really pinpoint if there is an issue, where does that issue come in? When does it become an issue, right? And yes. um, Roberta, so much, I'm, ha I'm just learning so much, but so much has already gone into um, the thinking, uh, you know, for these package packages and the design behind it. And, and it's, it, I can't even imagine the amount of, um, of time it takes really to, uh, to get to this point. Yeah. I'm curious, once you put you know devices out in the market, then um, in in these different types of packaging, you start to get some feedback from uh, from users, uh, whether they're patients or you know healthcare providers or what uh, physicians, whatever. Um, how much does that input then influence the design or redesign, um, including material selection and type? when you're thinking about new medical devices or perhaps new batches of um, older, you know, an old device design? Uh, great question. And super, super timely because of the increased emphasis on post-market surveillance, right? As we've been, dis you know, as we've been discussing with our validation practices. So first of all, human factors, 
as you alluded to, you know, in terms of the, the feedback from the customers, human factors is essential. You know, if you think about it, the interaction with the packaging is the first interaction that the healthcare provider is going to have with our product. And so, you know, it, the product can be fabulous, can delight them, exceed all their expectations, but if they can't open it or it's a pain to open or it's so difficult to open that, you know, when they finally peel apart that seal, the product goes flying across the room, you know, this is not going to bode well for us. And, you know, you can pretty much mess up the whole user experience with your really where you focused your technology on your product just because the packaging experience was unpleasant, totally avoidable. Of course, the labeling on the packaging, again, we can't, cannot minimize that. That is so crucial. You know, even if the package works great, but the label is illegible because uh, on the C-tainer, it was smudged because we didn't think about the humidity and the ink isn't dry. So if they can't read it, that's not only very inconvenient, but actually quite dangerous for the patient as well. So this human factors element, I really want to encourage everyone listening to, to do some market testing or at least um, to speak to some uh, users. And I mean, when I say the users of the package, so many people in the healthcare chain will interact with that packaging. It's not just the surgeon in an OR, right? right. You've got the, the nurse who's got to pull the package. You've got the folks um, who are responsible for inventory, who are going to store it. So really try to get feedback so that you can be considerate of how they need to use your product best. And as you're looking at the post-market data, so after you've designed it with human factors input and right. put it out there, yes, not, not only are you gonna be really looking for you know, any type of customer complaints regarding broken product, let's say a product has a lead, you know, an electronic lead and it doesn't work right. Well, maybe that's come loose. So it won't always be, it, it, sometimes it'll come out in non-functionality. Other times it's something straightforward and, you know, physical that you can just, uh, it's self-evident like a plastic tip is broken off because, you know, the package wasn't rigid enough or supportive in that area. So all of this type of feedback, then you would seek to reduce risk and we have our new standard, the ISO 24971 risk management standard sister document that was uh, finally released, yay, in 2020. And the, of course, the 14971 risk management document released in 2019 that tells us that with regard to redesign, we need to take customer feedback all the way back through to design as needed such that we reduce risks to patients as low as possible. So, Absolutely. and here we're talking about if you have a non-sterile situation, think about the level of risk that that implies. You know, if you're placing a product into the bloodstream or the cerebrospinal space or under the skin, you know, and, and it's not sterile. Yeah. I mean, this yeah, could result yeah. in permanent injury or death. Yes. Right, right, right. Quite serious. So we'll consider things like, you know, what is this? Is there a preference for the sterilization type? I know back in the day when, when I first started, there were certain countries that we sold products to that really didn't like any kind of irradiation source um, and preferred only ethylene oxide gas. So it's important to kind of know the culture uh, and the place, you know, and consider that in your packaging. Also, consider whether you want to have both a minimum and a maximum seal strength. May I tell you just a quick anecdote? Of course. Yeah. Illustrate that. Many, many manufacturers look at just a minimum seal strength because they figure as long as it's at least a certain, you know, number of pounds force to open it, it'll maintain its, it'll stay sealed and then you'll have your sterile barrier integrity. And many times, therefore, they don't put a maximum tolerance. But imagine, and I was actually in an, a surgery 
when the physician was trying, well, the charge nurse or the circulating nurse was trying to open this package and it was a like a procedural tray. It had a scalpel and some other you know, material. All the instruments, right. <laughs> and this one tray. And the lids, the lid could, wouldn't separate from the tray without extreme force because they only had a lower bound on the seal strength. It was only the minimum. Right. And I alluded to it in the beginning of our talk, but when she finally, when it, finally that lid gave way, the scalpel, I'll never forget it, it's disposable scalpel came arcing across the room, you know, over the head of the surgeon. So consider min and max bounds on, on your, your seal strength and how do they store it? Do they take it out of the box and store just the individual product or do they like to keep the boxes? All of these things are part of, you know, the considerations that the user will give us. Yeah. And you can only get that feedback by actually having the device out there in the field, right? And, and people interacting with it and using it and supplying that back to you. So it's such valuable information that you can collect, um, you know, post-market, as you mentioned. So we talked a little bit, we talked a lot then obviously about um, considering the packaging, the device itself, the interactions of the two together. And we've also, I feel like talked about shelf life um, pretty, pretty uh, covered that pretty well, especially with your example of checking at different intervals and, and the aging of the product. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, transit, right? Like how do we get these products to where they need to be? So can you talk a little bit about the testing process for ensuring that packaging meets requirements for transit life cycle? Because um, I imagine that you also need to consider, you know, how you're going to move these things around, like how you're going to deliver them. Oh, yes, absolutely. So uh, immediately I think of the ASTM distribution cycle testing. It's the D4169 that I mentioned before. Um, and then also the ISTA, there's an ISTA, an ISTA standard, the 1A and the 2A. And the one that you use depends on how you plan to ship your product. So for example, if it's, you know, if the product is weighs a certain amount, you'll choose one of the subtests, or if it's um, going over um, uh, rail, you know, a truck and rail, for example, it's going to be on a train and, and in a truck for distribution. And you have, you know, a certain subtest that there are different ones if it's going to have uh, be delivered by air. By the way, a quick watch out for your listeners, Stacy. If a product has not been validated uh, with its packaging to be able to withstand pressure changes because you don't plan to ship it by air, but there's a very special customer that you know really buys a lot of product and you wanna get it to them. There's an emergency and they ran out of something or there's an emergency surgery. So you're gonna put it on you know, an airplane, you're gonna overnight it to them. If you haven't validated it for those pressure changes, you know that product can arrive damaged or unsterile. It just, right. you know, it's better to get the broadest testing all at the same time if you can, even if you don't plan to use it now, just to have options. So that makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. So some of the things that you'll do are vibration. You'll subject the product in a laboratory setting again, so you can control the variables to vibration, um, compressive loads, because if you think about it, can be stacked. What if your product's at the bottom, you know, and the, right. and the shipping containers are stacked at the pallet, you know, or high up in a truck? What happens to the guy at the bottom of the, of the pile, right? Um, and then drop testing, because again, the momentum, when you drop a product, it's not just about the height from which it's dropped. It has to do with momentum, right? A heavier product dropped from the same height as a lighter product, the heavier product has much more momentum. So you can have totally different um, results. So all of these things are tested as part of package performance. So we're gonna do- Are you also testing against like extreme heat and cold? 
because uh, assuming you could be sending these to uh, uh, you know area of the world where it's much hotter uh, temperature wise than it is you know where you're making them or vice versa obviously much colder so is that also part of this part of the testing absolutely and that's such a great point especially these days when there's so much talk about um, you know cold side distribution like for for our vaccines right, right. Uh, where right. the requirements to keep you know certain materials have to be kept at certain temperatures yes and absolutely even with a medical device you know not just a biologic even with a medical device many times for example um, medical devices such as hemodialyzers used for dialysis will for example will contain saline they'll be primed they'll have fluid inside. And if they should become frozen during their shipping cycle, those fibers will explode because, right, frozen liquids right. they expand. Yeah. expand yeah. Right. But by the time it gets to the patient, it may have thawed out. So it looks like it was never frozen. And yet it doesn't, it doesn't work at all. In fact, it's quite dangerous. So yes, you're right. There are temperature cycling um, protocols within these standards. There are humidity cycling requirements, um, very arid uh, shipping products, you know, to very arid places also can have a huge impact. So the lack of moisture, not just too much moisture. Um, we've got to look at, so the package performance over all of these challenges are specified in the standards that I mentioned. And then you just choose the sub tests within the standards to meet your distribution cycle. But remember, I really recommend choosing the largest one possible because invariably, even if, you know, the sales and marketing team says, oh, we're really, we're not going to ship to that region of the world. We really just want to get this out quickly. You know, you'll have to duplicate everything if they right. ever want to, you know, right. maybe, maybe if you make the testing as broad as possible, but pull product at each different stage, if you don't pass the whole shebang, well, then you still have a fallback position that is documented. Right. No, that makes perfect sense. Totally perfect, perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we already alluded to this a little bit, but we know that most, uh, most companies and our listeners, uh, companies included, are really usually looking to streamline and reduce costs wherever possible. So what uh, elements should they focus on to improve efficiency and speed time to market? I mean, one of the things obviously you've been talking about is do all of your testing up front so you don't get stuck having to redo things. But what, what other elements um, would we be concerned with here if hmm. we're looking for efficiency and uh, fastest time to market? Gee, uh, let me, let's see. Well, you're right. We covered, we talked a bit about stacking up the challenges Yes. So that you don't have to do each test separately. Oh, and by the way, in my, some of my interactions with the regulatory bodies, FDA and the notified bodies as well in the European Union, they're, what I'm hearing is they're actually expecting stack challenges because the product, worst case, the product is going to get to the patient after a multiple serial cycles, worst case. Right and distribution, and it sat on the shelf for its entire shelf life, maybe just right up to the edge, <laughs> and then it's used. And it still better meet its product spec, right? So just to keep in mind, um, but in addition to the things that we've talked about there, I would, I would say other areas where we could really get some bang for our buck and efficiency and leaning out the process would be if it's appropriate for our product, it's not too, it doesn't have too high a density, looking at an e-beam system that you could actually install in line with your manufacturing process so that literally if you imagine a conveyor belt you know you you assemble yeah. the product and then it's packaged right there on the same same production line and then goes right past the electron beam of course you're gonna have shielding and everything but it's right there you just flip the switch it's on and then you turn it off when you're done now your product is completely done. You don't have to ship it out to a sterilization uh, facility. You don't have to wait for any kind of aeration or any kind of results to come back to ship. 
you know, it's done and you can go direct. Um, so that's, that's huge. Also looking at automation in other ways, like, for example, having an automated um, form fill seal machine where literally the, the stock, the material for the tray and the lid come off of a giant roll, rolls out, a die comes down and presses the shape of the, you know, the right. container into it for whatever product that is, the product can be picked and placed with an arm, a robotic arm, you validate the process, you validate the software that's part of the process. And it's, it's not subject to the kind of human errors that we often see. Of course, there are other types of errors, but it's more reliable, cheaper, faster. Um, you know, you can, you can really get some big bang for your buck there if you can automate these processes, these packaging processes. And if you can put the sterility in line with the manufacturing and packaging um, process. Uh, the only other thing to add is just a reminder about that interval testing for incremental shelf life. Yeah, very important, very important. Uh, that will save you a lot of time, um, you know, if you get to the end and it failed after three years and you have no idea. <laughs> it's a long time. I mean, if you got to start that whole process over again, you know what I mean? It can be a lot of time lost for oh. sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you know what you just reminded me, Stacy. There's another thing to consider. Uh, again, when you're looking at where you're going to distribute and sell the product, mm -hmm. for example, um, many young engineers are surprised when they come into the industry to learn that uh, in Japan, for example, to sell product in Japan, you'll actually need, if your shelf life is going to be three years, so that's 36 months, right? Right. In Japan, you actually need to age it for 37 months in order to label it for 36 months. And so uh, whatever you shelf, yeah, you have to add a month for Japan. Otherwise, you'll find yourself in a situation where you've got 36 months of testing under your belt and you can't release it in Japan. You have to start the entire three years over again just to get that last month. So so it's important really to um, make sure you not only do the testing, but um, kind of kind of go even beyond what your own expectations are for your product, right? Always do a little bit more so that you have tested worst case scenario, that you know your, your shelf life is, um, can last longer than what you're actually labeling it for. There's all kinds of, you know, con yes. little considerations that are just going to make the whole process so much easier down the road. Um, and you have to think, you have to think day one of building all of those things into your, um, into your process. Yes. And knowing, <laughs> knowing we, we should never approach a design verification or process validation, not knowing what the results are going to be. So we can make, you're right, exactly. We should make it as challenging as possible to open up those possibilities. You know, if sure enough, we're going to have a, a kappa come up, some kind of nonconformity where we're going to wish that we knew what the res, what, whether we could re-sterilize a product, you know, so Building that in up front increases efficiency, but we don't want to make our tests so challenging that we fail needlessly if we actually could have a very reliable, safe, and effective product with a slightly shorter shelf life, for example. So yeah, knowing before we start that it's feasible for this to actually work. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, there is, I want to thank you for spending so much time with us today, Roberta, on this topic. Um, it's so fascinating to think about all of the elements and all of the considerations uh, that go into uh, this particular topic. And, you know, like I said at the beginning, I think until you really dive into this subject, you don't realize just how much the packaging matters for medical devices. It's true. So true. So as we get ready to wrap up today, Roberta, I just want to give you an opportunity uh, to talk about some key takeaways that you think um, our listeners, you know, should have as they uh, as they think 
further about this topic? Hmm. Well, two things come to mind, Stacey. Um, I guess the first is, and we didn't really have time today to cover this in much detail, but perhaps you cover it elsewhere within the IVT um, library. I know for sure I've seen good coverage of, of the types of seal strength testing, the package integrity testing that will, that our, your listeners will want to consider, whether it's burst testing or dye tests or, um, you know, capacitance or tracer gas testing. These are all, there are so much technology and so many details available about how to do this testing. And, and of course, I just briefly also mentioned the tensile testing of a seal segment, which is done regularly in the production environment, even after you've validated your entire process. So that's an area just for our, your listeners maybe to dive into uh, more deeply to really understand what types of testing make sense for their packaging design and materials of construction. Great. That's a, that is a great tip. That is definitely a great tip. Um, all right. I think we, I think we've given everybody plenty to think about today for sure. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it there, but of course um, we can definitely provide links in the show notes to any, all of the, the um, regulations and standards that you mentioned. Uh, and uh, if anyone has questions, I will also include the ways in which they can get in touch with you to uh, do some follow-up. So thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. I love our conversations. Yeah, we love having you as a guest, Roberta, for sure. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time um, to talk about this very important topic with us today. Thanks, Dave. I also want to give a big shout out to Ben Kitchen, our producer. And most importantly, a big thanks to you, our valued listeners. If you have topic requests or guest suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. And you can message us through LinkedIn or through our website. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to your podcast player of choice and subscribe. And be sure to share with your friends, colleagues, and online networks. We really do appreciate you helping us spread the good word. For today's show notes and information about this podcast, you can visit www.ivtnetwork.com. We'll be back again next week with another great interview and discussion. Until then, make it a great week.